Wonderful. And there. So I would request uh, Mr. Ambarish Tarshkupta, the president of the Bengal Club, a great supporter of reading, writing, and arithmetic, as we say, um, and very supportive of the library subcommittee. If you would kindly come in and say a few words, Ambarish, that would be marvelous. Thank you, Dr. Uh, as we call you, Julie. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I also compliment you, Julie. Before I move into introduce Mr. Gunesekhar, I compliment you first for starting this book club journey of ours. And I understand today is the 16th one that we are having, which we started approximately, I think, three years back. In fact, uh, I was just wondering when we started this, hesitatingly, this book club journey and you championed and you gave us this idea. Today, I feel that uh, Tony Morrison once said that in 1996, the opera's book club, when it started, it in the first three years, you have given a reading revolution in the three years to this Bengal club, uh, book club as well, like as Tony uh, opera. Uh, thank you very much. Moving into uh, the introduction of Mr. Ramesh Gunesekhara. Of course, Julie, you will have to do the main introduction about the books, but Mr. Gunesekhara, we are very honored to have you here with us today. <clears throat> and uh, as we know, Mr. Gunesekhara was born in 1954, so quite a young, uh, uh, from considering his accomplishments in Sri Lanka, then Ceylon, spending his childhood there and later Philippines. In 1971, he moved to England, where he read English and philosophy at the University of Liverpool. Before he embarked on his writing career, he worked also at the British Council, managing its international education projects in Eastern Europe and East Asia. He debuted as a prose writer with a short story collection, Monkfish Moon, and is best known for many novels, Booker Shortlisted, Reef, Sandglass, Tail and Sage, but I will leave the main part of his introduction of the books to Dr. Mehta. What I remember, I borrowed just one line from his book because it really appealed to me, one line from one of his book, that we are only what we remember, nothing more. All we have is the memory of what we have done and not done. So that's the line which really appealed to me because his books, which very much reverberates against the migrant memory, that very much resonates with the literature of this Bengal also. Because many of our literatures from Shunil Babu to Shokti to Niren Chakraborty to the movies of Vitti Ghatto to the writings of Profula Rai, all actually resonates around the migrant memory of what these five Gaubini people have left there. And I'm sure Dr. Mehta possibly will be able to refer to Mr. Gunasekhara to the literatures that of the Bengal that speaks of this migrant memory. And I think there would be a very good connection between Mr. Gunasekara's migrant memory and the migrant memory of the Bengal literature. With this, I will hand over to you, Dr. Mehta, and also again, once more, thank Mr. Gunasekara for coming here and honoring us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambarish. As always, on target, short, sweet, and very sharp. It's a great honor and a pleasure to have Ramesh here with us. So welcome everyone across ponds and puddles on this classical tropical evening in Kolkata. This is our 16th book club meeting in 17 months of the Bengal Club Book Club. On behalf of the president, Mr. Amorish Tashkupto, whom you just heard, chair of the library subcommittee, Dr. Shundip Chatterjee, and the library subcommittee itself, I'm exceedingly chuffed, honored, that celebrated novelist and Booker Prize nominee, Mr. Ramesh Gunasekara, has so graciously and generously agreed to be our distinguished author today. I first met Ramesh 27 years ago at the Tangling Club, Singapore. And my doctoral dissertation at the University of Toronto included three of his works among 150 mandatory texts. Ramesh Gunasekara's destiny has located him in the tides that lap the shores of three islands. His paradigmatic geography with the ocean has punctuated his literary history. Born in 1954 in Sri Lanka, where he spent his early years, he lived in the Philippines, also an island, before coming to Britain. 
The fact that Reef, his first novel, earned a luminous place on the shortlist of the Booker Prize in 1994, and is still a favorite among a sizable global readership, might validate his deep bond with the sea. But more fascinating, perhaps, is the fact that it was Ramesh Kunisekara who had predicted a possible tsunami with the erosion in the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal way, way back in 1994 in Reef, 10 years before Amitav Ghosh in The Hungry Tide. Ramesh Gunasekara's early stories were published in Scammed magazine, London magazine, and Granta, and his poems in the London, London Literary, or no, it was a London Review of Books, I think, Poetry Down, and other magazines. His widely first acclaimed novel, Reef, was published in 94, and in the USA, he was nominated for a New Voice Award, as well as the Guardian Fiction Prize, shortlisted as a finalist for the Booker. However, it was Monkfish Moon in 1992, a debut collection of Ramesh Gunasekara's beautifully modulated, outstanding short stories that got me hooked. Monkfish Moon was one of the first titles in Granta's venture, I think, if I'm not wrong, into book publishing. It was shortlisted for several prizes and named a New York Times notable book for 1993. At the time, I was arts and literary reviewer of the Straits Times Singapore. And when Reef was published, in my capacity as the chair of the Tanglin Club Library Subcommittee, we invited Ramesh as speaker to the club. Monkfish Moon makes direct references to specific historical and political events, explores the conflict between Tamil and Sinhalese, and becomes vital to the understanding of the context of the stories. In 98, he received the inaugural BBC Asia Award for achievement in writing and literature for his novel, The Sand Glass. The litany of prizes is unending. His third novel, Heaven's Edge, a dystopian kind of novel set in the near future, was published by Bloomsbury. Four years later came The Match, hailed as one of the first novels in which cricket was celebrated, and it was a forerunner of the many cricket-related novels that have followed. In 2008, a collection of his Madeira stories were published. Next no novel, The Prisoner of Paradise, which I'm still plowing through, absolutely wonderfully descriptive and reminds me of my teenage years when I wanted so much to visit the island paradise of Mauritius. Then came his book, Noontide Dawn, in 2014, and then came Suncatcher. And in 2019, I'm not quite sure, but I still think I read somewhere that it won the Jhalak Prize. Ramesh Gunasekara is an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and has also received a national honor in Sri Lanka. He's been a judge of so many literary prizes. Um, the one that I think is, is, is worth thinking of is that he was um, the judge in 2015 for the Commonwealth Short Story Writers Prize. He's been a guest director at the Cheltenham Festival. And for four years, until 2013, he was on the Council of the Royal Society of Literature. Without further ado, we will keep coming back to his accomplishments, I'm sure, through the course of the evening. But the way I think that I've sort of structured this evening is to have the conversation with Ramesh. As I said, he's been exceedingly kind. And despite the fact three days ago, he was diagnosed for COVID, he still faced the formidable challenge and is with us. So in case he flags, 
uh, in his energy levels, I thought we'd grab him in the beginning and have a conversation. And then maybe after about 45 minutes, move on to our presenters, our responders to his book, The Reef. So Ramesh, in the popular journal Kuna Pipi in 1999, you wrote this unforgettable bit. And I quote, in 1956, my father was 39 years old. He didn't even know how to boil an egg. <laughs> but within two years, he was creating the, the cookiest dinners in Washington and had the World Bank eating out of his hand. When he got back, everybody wanted to know how he'd done it. Easy, he would say, shrugging his big round shoulders. String hoppers. I fed them string hoppers. His friends were mystified. In the end, for my father, the string hopper was what knitted reality together as he traveled the world. Beijing, Manila, Kabul, and finally London. A mixture of hope and home, art and life, society and solitude. For my father, getting strangers to eat strange food was at the heart of the human story, the point at which the old world slips into myth and a new world stumbles free. The meal was where we could begin to understand each other. Beautifully crafted, the whole flavor of globalization, multiculture, which, which we drumbeat about today, and academia talks about the world becoming a global village, it appears that your father was global so long before the current bandwagon. And for those of us who read your novels, your prose works, your prolific opinion pieces, academic articles, see the breadth of that vision, that acceptance of diversity. Tell us about your childhood, Ramesh. And now, when you look back, what effect those early years had on you? Thank you, Julie. Thank you uh, uh, for that introduction, for all your comments, uh, and for the, for the welcome early as well. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I only wish I was there in person in Kolkata, which I like very much. Um, you, uh, your question about uh, my childhood, I suppose, is it's a huge question. An answer is perhaps uh, it's taken me the last 27 years writing these books, partly to answer, answer that maybe. <laughs> um, but looking back, I suppose um, I was very lucky as a child, um, though it had its tribulations as well. And in a in a sense, my you know you were talking about reef. Uh, reef is a book set uh, largely in the nineteen sixties, I suppose. Um, but refers to that era, if you like, uh, of uh, when I was growing up. But the most recent book, Suncatcher, which you also mentioned, uh, this one, is very much set in that period um, in the 60s and maybe does give a glimpse, if you like, of, uh, of those childhood years because it's a story about two young boys growing up and their very fragile friendship. Um, and the reason I'm lucky, I suppose, is I am indebted, obviously, to, like most people to uh, family and parents. Um, and in my case, my parents were very wide ranging in their outlook. And I think um, many of the people in this, in this virtual room will recognize that because in Kolkata as well, I sensed a, a similar sense of openness um, and uh, 
there's a sense in the history of Kolkata, I think, looking at it from the outside. Um, I suspect that that period, uh, the very cosmopolitan period that was there in Kolkata, perhaps in the, in the 50s, um, was very similar. Um, it was in, in Ceylon as it was, I think. Um, my sense of the world was growing, I suppose, uh, with glimpses of things from outside, but it was a very, uh, in, in a sense, it allowed me to see many things, but I was also very, very lucky because my, my father was lucky enough to get jobs abroad at, from time to time, which enabled me to travel at a time when most people in Ceylon couldn't travel for one reason or another, including uh, foreign exchange problems, which at the moment the country is suffering enormously from as well, again, yet again. Um, so I, all of that, I suppose, fed into the sense of the world that I have and the sense of belonging not to just one place, but to many places. Um, and I come back actually to, to Kolkata and the, and the few weeks that I've spent there sporadically is um, uh, I felt very at home when I was there, which is why in honor of that, I'm wearing a jacket that I got made in Kolkata Park Street at a tailor's there. Uh, last time I was there. Shall I, shall we have an up? Another question, or do you want to? Yes, yes, to carry sure. On? Sure, we'll come back to the issue of uh, uh, the diasporic soul in a minute uh, or two, uh, Ramesh. Um, and I think uh, many of us feel that despite having many homes, there is a sense of homelessness. Um, but I just want to, um, you know, get, get on with the, you know, your growing years and. So after coming to England and entering the University of Liverpool, how easy or difficult was your acculturation from Asia? I remember Michael Ondaatje saying that it was jazz um, and his, uh, you know, surreptitious visits to the jazz clubs uh, in London that helped him find comfort in an alien culture um, during his teenage years. Um, tell us about your interests in music. You know, the Beatles were there and then the Who and well, and, it's, it's um, or art or sports that you. It's interesting, uh, actually. Um, okay, uh, can I just check? Is the connection okay? Are you hearing me all right? Yes, yes. So far, so good. Not very clear, but clear okay. enough. Clear enough. Okay. Um. Um. I'll just uh, see if I can improve it a little bit. Excuse me, one moment. Okay. Okay. Um, better. See whether that connection makes it a bit better. Um, better, better. Yeah, I think it's it is interesting. Um, in it's interesting that when Michael Ondaatje came to live in England, he found I think he said that writing was very difficult because he felt the weight of a lot of writing around him. The historical weight was was a little stifling. Uh, whereas for me, I think it was the opposite. Really, uh, I felt that uh, writing creatively seemed much more natural uh, and a possibility. But the cultural changes you're talking about. For me, um, there are two things, I suppose. One is that when I came to live in England, it wasn't the first time I'd been to England. Um, I had actually come as a child. Uh, I like to think of it as um, to remind myself that the world is not always the way it seems, so that when I came in the 1950s, 
I came, you might say, as a tourist. Um, the way only now people are recognizing that uh, travel can be tourism in different ways. It's not always west to east, it's east to west as well. But the other more important thing is that before I came to England, I went from Ceylon to the Philippines and the cultural shock of that was much, much greater because the Philippines is such, was and is such an unusual country in Asia. And at that time, uh, which is in the 60s, it was almost an unimaginable country in Asia. Uh, it was a hugely Americanized country. It was a Catholic country. And it was, its colonial history was Spanish. All these are really very distinctive in Asia. Um, and the disparities between the rich and the poor in the Philippines in the 60s is something we recognize now everywhere in India, um, in England, in Sri Lanka. But at that time, it was uh, extraordinary. So I think that was really the big cultural shock. And then to come from the Philippines to England, the huge difference was a bit like coming from the 21st century to the, to the late 19th, um, just coming to a country where things were oddly familiar um, because of the historical connections between Ceylon and, and England, uh, but also oddly old fashioned. But it's interesting you mention the music, the Beatles. Uh, you see in Sun Catcher, for example, the, the, the boy in there uh, talking, talking a little bit about the Beatles and yes. the influence of that. Um, and yes, when I came, I was, I was really very, very keen to, to discover that world, if you like, in England. And I came to live in Liverpool, in fact, which in the pop culture of the time uh, was a few years earlier than I came, seen as almost the center of the universe. Yes, <laughs> yes. But of course it wasn't by the time I got there. Yes. So, um, moving into the issue of those growing years, uh, which you so poignantly and inventively explore in most of your work, uh, fascinating actually, uh, the way that you build up the Bildungsroman, the rites of passage, the growing up, the child mind, and it's been a reiterative thread in all your fiction. And I'm particularly thinking of uh, Sun Katcha, as you said, a prisoner of paradise, which I have fallen in love with, Reef. So why does that process of the growing years fascinate you? And how do you think that it's become a sort of forte um, in your writing style? And I remember this coming up when we had uh, doctoral seminars on your work. And my thesis supervisor, Professor Chelva Kanaganaikam, who was uh, from your wonderful country, mentioned that um, in world literature today, Ramesh Kunasekara stands out for his um, nuanced articulation of the child mind and the growing up years. How would you respond to that, Ramesh? Well, I guess 
you know, your, your childhood years are your formative years. And, and it's when your senses are at their freshest and it's your most impressionable years. Um, and as a writer, I suppose I um, find that very exciting and, and uh, valuable, I suppose. And I find that I need to use those senses to look at the world now, if I am to see it. Um, and in the writing, I suppose it's a very odd thing. I, I, it's interesting that you you uh, point it out so so accurately and clearly. Um, but when I, if I think about it at all, it seems to me that there are two perspectives that fascinate me. One is the young eye looking at the world, and the other is the very much older eye looking at the world. Um, and I guess Mr. Dasgupta uh, quoted a line which is very much the older yes. uh, person looking at the world. Um, and if I think about it, uh, it's, it's very odd and I'm sure people can, can uh, analyze it more interestingly, but I think even when I was very young, um, starting out to write, I would sometimes um, have characters that are very elderly. And uh, I have, I don't think I could place my hand on it now, but I have come across some very early writings of mine, which sound to me extremely uh, written from a, very, a perspective of a much older person. Mm. So I have obviously had a fascinating fascination for that. And um, mm. I, I sometimes find, for example, um, in a book, um, not The Prisoner of Paradise, but an earlier book, Heaven's Edge. Yes. There is, a, there is an old, older character, um, I'm just trying to think whether it was, yeah, I think it's in that book, um, where uh, I eventually ended up writing a scene in there, which was quite an important one about an older person and uh, uh, their marriage, I think. But much later, I discovered that a very similar scene, I'd written a very similar scene sort of 15 years earlier, which I had never used, but I'd completely forgotten about. So that, <laughs> excuse me, so that there is that, um, maybe that fascination or, or obsession maybe yes. with looking at the world from these two perspectives, the, yeah. the younger and the older. Uh, Ramesh, you've sort of second guessed my next question, uh, which is about okay. the journey. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I didn't say it. I, I'm sorry, did I cut you? I'm so sorry, please continue. No, no, I think that, that was just a, just a sound here that interrupted. Oh, okay. So the journey through three decades, 10 books, in some definitive way must be about retrieval. You know, when you talk about the young uh, person looking back and the old person um, looking back, the young person looking at the world, many readers are interested by how you have negotiated the muddy scapes of memory. And, you know, I'm fascinated by uh, memory studies, which is, I think, a wonderful new way in which we, um, interrogate the connection between time and narrative and your tellings. Um, and this sort of wrestles with the act of remembering. 
So do you think the inevitable instability of memory uh, makes for a kind of richer avenue of creativity? And I'm thinking the way Salman Rushdie speaks about something being gained in translation rather than being lost. Yes, yes, I, 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 yeah, memory, I think. Yeah, memory, I think, is at the heart of it. Um, it's at the heart of our sense of ourselves. Um, I also think it's, it's um, the relationship between memory and and writing, um, any kind of writing, I think is elemental. It, it's, it's sort of um, the re, I think I've said it before, you know, the way I see it, writing is, has been invented so that we can negotiate with memory, um, so that we can have some sort of access to that same thing that has passed. Yes. Um, and so I think for the for a writer, it's you know, it's the fundamental material. Um, and you need it on, you know, you need it at the sentence level. You know, you can't complete a sentence without memory, without knowing what had gone before. I can just about do it by writing it because you can see it. Mm. But you can, you know, that negotiation with with is is fundamental and to me uh, a lot of a lot of the fiction we read is really fiction about memory not about anything else um, and how we how we remember and I've, what I've noticed I guess is that in some senses uh, I have quite a good memory uh, <laughs> I can remember moments from from my you know early years, which what which is what goes into the books. Yes. But at the same time, I know very well that my memory is um, very unreliable. Yes. yes. And there are things that I remember very very vividly, which are simply not true. Yes. Um, and then there are other things, and uh, there's quite a bit of that with this most recent book, Suncatcher, because yeah. it is set in the 60s, where I have to rely on my memory and I cannot corroborate it because there's either nobody else around from that moment or the ones who are around just don't remember the same thing. Exactly. I think you've uh, what you've said resonates uh, very deeply because... Uh, you know, uh, in a household where you have a historian and somebody who's a critical uh, reader of, of literature, you have that argument about the lines between fiction and history being so blurred that fiction becomes history and history becomes fiction. So uh, I think you've explained it beautifully. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Ramesh. Um, you know, in the introduction to your 25th anniversary edition of Reef, Pico Picoire, whom we have also um, explored in this book club quite intimately, uh, in his inimitable way tags you as, I think, the connoisseur of displacement. Now, as a diasporic British hyphenated Sri Lankan writer, how do you see yourself? Obviously, you're very connected from what I read um, and what you write and have always felt the pulse of Sri Lanka. For all these decades, you've been out of the country and have yet kept very closely in touch with an embattled once homeland. It's possibly one of the most complex and challenging mysteries or muddles of those of us who are diasporics. You're also very well integrated into your adopted homeland, the United Kingdom. My question is, 
how do you see yourself? And the question is a question of identity. And I'm reminded of what your co colleague, Sham Selvadurai, um, once said during a class visit to my class at the University of Toronto, when he was asked the same question. So how do you see yourself? But I will reveal that answer of his after your response. <laughs> well, uh, for me, I think um, I don't see identity as a reductive thing. Um, and unfortunately, there's a tendency which has been growing over many, 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 many years to actually reduce our sense of ourselves so that we become um, kind of a mono identity. And I just think that that's not the natural state of affairs and that naturally we are actually very pluralistic. We have plural identities. Yes. So at the simplest level, you know, you're not ever just a mother. You're always also a daughter. You're never just a son. You may also be a brother or a father. And these identities sometimes overlap, sometimes complement each other, sometimes do the reverse, but they're all part of you. And so when I see myself, if I'm reduced to just one label, then it becomes just a writer. Mm. But other yeah. than that, yeah. you know, I can be a Sri Lankan writer, a British writer, even a Singaporean writer or a Filipino writer. I, yeah. you know, I would be happy with any of them. And in the issue of translation, actually, if you go straight to it, it's quite interesting as well. When you translate it, you become something else. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's useful to think of uh, some identities. So it's useful to think of Tolstoy as a Russian writer, but he's also, if you happen to love Tolstoy's writing, he's your writer. Um, and I think it was, I can't remember who it was, I think it was C.L.R. James, I think mm. the Caribbean philosopher who said long ago that, you know, uh, Beethoven doesn't belong to Germany. It belongs to all of us who love his music. Um, yes. So in that sort of sense, I, you know, I like to keep an identity wide open. And I remember when my, one of the very first stories I written and had broadcast on BBC here, to have been back in the 90s, around about the time of the Tangling Club and all of that we were talking about. Yeah. Um, or a bit earlier than that, really, um, was a story that was all about two Cypriot characters in London, uh, set not very far from where I am at the moment. Um, there were no Sri Lankan characters in it. But I remember when it was a broadcast, this was the day, days before email and so on, I think I got a letter from a listener who was pleased and delighted and everything else um, because she thought I was a Greek writer from Cyprus. <laughs> uh, and in fact, thought she recognized the name from some <laughs> friend of hers. <laughs> Um, Romesh, you spoke about. Oh, you must say what Shyam said. You, you invoked CLR James and uh, Beethoven. Uh, uh, Romesh, you invoked CLR James, uh, the Caribbean writer, and what he said about Beethoven, his music belonging to the world. You know, Robindranath Tagore, who was born in what is now uh, Bangladesh at that time, 
after partition East Bengal, uh, there's a tussle about him all the time between people from this part of Bengal, Epar Bangla, with those on the other side, Opar Bangla, about where he really is located. And this is exactly the point. He is of the universal stature uh, where he belongs to everyone. So, uh, you know, that brings me to uh, this idea that you, you had uh, put on the table about um, uh, where do you belong? I mean, your, your identity as a writer. And let me, before I go into, um, uh, you know, the, the the ensuing debate about that. You know what uh, Sham said to uh, the students in my class? I never forget it. He said, you ask me if I'm a gay writer. You ask me if I'm a hyphenated uh, Sri Lankan Canadian writer. You ask me if I'm a South Asian writer. Just can't you let me be a bloody writer, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's stupendous because that points to what you are trying to undergird, I think, that it is more than just being pigeonholed and stereotyped uh, and put into little boxes and saying, that, oh, you belong there and you belong there, because at the end of the day, that's what, you know, the idea of multiculture, uh, intersectionality, the idea of each of us saying what another person feels is all about. Um, and that leads me to asking you about how did you get into the art and then the business of writing? How hard was it? Who were the writers who inspired you? And now you've even written a wonderful book on the writers and artists companion to novel writing with uh, A.L. Kennedy. So I think you're, you're preeminently qualified to tell us about um, the inspiration and in where you drew from. Um, thank you, okay. It, um, it's obviously a long story, but I'll try and make it a very short one. So the, there's, the, there's two things, I suppose. Um, I uh, I wanted to I started wanting to write uh, when I was growing up in the Philippines. So you could say that the Philippines made me a writer, and the reason for that is very 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 simple. Um, before that, I think growing up in Sri Lanka, I had no, not even the faintest glimmer of an idea that I might want to be a writer but I loved reading um, and I like to read what everyone who's a reader of my sort of age would recognize as the kind of things that you would find in bookshops or a library in a place like Colombo which is uh series novels that kids like, uh, what us as pulp fiction, detective yes. stories, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't an education in the in the classics in any sense at all. Um, but I just enjoyed the opportunity their book gave to escape into a brighter world, which is a very odd thing for me to say now, because I suppose what I'm trying to write is the brighter world quite often that the young person sees. Um, and quite often it might be the place that I was at. But as a child, I was simply wanting to escape into the pages of a book. But in the Philippines, I discovered that and this is partly because of its Americanized culture of the time, that you had books written by people who, whose authorship was being celebrated. 
Uh, and that was where I discovered that books were written by individual people and that they didn't just appear in a bookshop, that someone actually <laughs> made these books. And that's when I started reading about writers. And I thought, well, I'd like to do that. So that you might say was, was the starting point, but it was actually here in England, reading different sorts of books and largely due to this wonderful uh, gift, I suppose, that had been given or created maybe, which was the public library system here, which meant that suddenly there was this universe of books I had access to that I could read freely. Um, and I became much more interested in different sorts of books. And so maybe you could say that though the Philippines may be a writer, living in England may be the kind of writer I am because I wanted to write um, books that had some sort of longevity to them. Um, so that's one part of an answer to your question. The other is that, yeah, so it took me an awful long time if you just do the maths between <laughs> starting out as a teenager in the Philippines in the 60s to producing a book, which was Mount Pishmoor, which came out in the 90s. So it was a, a, a slow, long and difficult process. Um, it wasn't easy to break into publishing. It wasn't easy to get anything published, but I wouldn't say that that's because somehow um, uh, the odds were against me or anything like that. The primary problem for not having a book published before that was simply because I hadn't written one. Uh, the real difficulty is writing your, your stories, your poems, your books, just as, as in terms of the, your earlier question of identity. Um, yes, I want to be nothing more than a writer, but actually there is one category I'd like to be, which is a good writer. Absolutely, 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 Ramesh. Um, a question that niggles a little bit. Uh, not a very comfortable question, perhaps, but I think the kind of formidable, thoughtful, <laughs> and articulate person that you are, you might like to um, have a go at this googly. In Reef, when I taught the novel in Canada, the diasporic demographic in my class from Sri Lanka, whether they were Sinhalese or whether they were Tamil, you know, it's as if a Sri Lankan novelist can never get it right. The Sinhalese component in the class was quite happy but the Tamil component felt that there were not enough representations of Tamil people. Now, this is the same thing that happened when Ondapche's Anil's Ghost came out. Um, you know, there... what would you say to that? How would you respond to that, uh, Ramesh? I would, I would say very simply that this is, the story is led entirely by the world that the narrator is in, which is the world of Triton. Yes. And the world that he, you know, it's a story of his world slowly opening up. And at that point in time, I have tried to be as true as I can to what I think this character would experience and see and the people he would meet. So it isn't setting out to, if you like, provide a comprehensive representation of anything. 
it is really to try and uh, open up his world for us to see and experience. And in that, whether you find correspondences or parallels to your own is a question. So um, I would probably just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, I would have thought to have imported in other characters would be a weakness and a fault. There may be other weaknesses as well. Um, and again, I think it's a matter, I don't know, I think people from um, different, different backgrounds who know of that period, I think recognize it much as much truer. Yes. Uh, point point noted and, and understood and uh, absolutely, absolutely right. Um, one of the questions that, um, well, it's really an observation um, which points you to the direction of food waste. And I think one of the most felicitous parts of reading um, Reef for most of us, um, from what I'm hearing and what, if you stay on, perhaps you will hear too, is that um, the culinary, um, you know, abilities, the interest, the passion of Triton. Um, is there some of you in that? Oh yes, there is. There is a lot of me in that. Um, I mean, the general point is that in any book, I think there's a lot of uh, the author in it. I would as you know, I'm sure when we spoke in Tanglin in 96, you might have asked me a similar question. I would have said, no, Reef has no autobiography in it and that I don't write autobiographically. Uh, but the truth is that you do draw on yourself. Um, but so yes, so the the culinary part of it comes certainly from me. Um, I like to cook. Um, my father, as you read out, couldn't cook at one point, but became actually a very accomplished cook in his later years. Um, but when I was writing the book, I was not trying to make a point about the food and the role of food in it. Um, it grew naturally as the obsession that Triton latches onto. Uh, he finds this his route to his own identity, to come back to what we were talking to about. He is looking for his identity and he realizes his identity is completely linked to his vocation. In other words, it is to do with what he can do best. And he discovers what he can do best is to cook. Uh, um, and it is his art. And it is what makes him, in a sense, an artist. And the connection to me is both to do with the cooking, but it's also to, to, with my own sense of feeling that I might possibly be a novelist and that this is what I might be able to do. And both he and I are on the same journey in that sense of discovering what is it we can do. In his case, it is cooking. Um, but I didn't set out to sort of highlight that. Um, and I know, again, a bit like a cricket novel, uh, this was one of, the, one of the early examples of a novel that uh, uh, almost fetishizes the whole business of eating um, and culinary delights, I suppose. Um, and 
after that book came out, we did have a lot more talk about food and fiction. I discovered, you know, we even started to get festivals themed on food and fiction. And in fact, that story you read a bit of about the father not knowing how to boil an egg uh, was originally published in a in an issue in a grata issue on food. Ah. Um, but it's not as though food was seen in writing before that. It's just that it was a different kind. Even in Ulysses, you get yes. quite a lot about food, but it tends to be about kidneys or liver. It's true. And I think in a way, um, what uh, you managed to do in Reef is uh, you endow Triton with elements of such meticulousness in the way he prepares the dishes uh, that his relationships with Ranjan Salagado, his relationship with Miss Nili and all the visitors um, are about the care and the love he puts into food. And I think that's something that most readers would have enjoyed greatly. Oh, did you, did you want a response on that? Yes, I was wondering. Yeah. I, I was wondering what. Yes, you I think it is. It is his his. Uh, Yes, it is. It is the way he does look at the world and see other people. Um, his, uh, but his relationship, I suppose, you know, it is. It is very much the relationship of the artist with the art for him, I think. And you know, this is not something I thought of at the time when I was writing it, but I can see it now. So that. Uh, he is like, I think, I would imagine um, the, the best chefs in the world. And of course, he's not a chef, he's just a cook. He just does one sort of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. But it is that you may, uh, and I'm sure some of you uh, in this room who enjoy uh, providing hospitality or entertaining people for meals and so on will recognize this. To some extent, yes, you do want to create something that other people appreciate. And so when people say that his food is very good, he is pleased. Uh, and I think it says somewhere how much he needs that kind of uh, response. And that's true of any artist. If you think of a great painter, uh, you think of uh, Michelangelo or someone like that, you know, at one level, yes, of course, you know, they want someone to see this and appreciate it. But at the same time, that isn't the the only thing or isn't necessarily even the most important thing. The deeper relationship is between the painter and the painting. When he or she is actually working on the painting, whatever that relationship is, 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 is the summit. It is the best thing. And in the same way for Triton, it's actually the cooking, the preparation, his engagement with what he's doing is the thing that is most important. And so quite often he will provide some wonderful dish, which the people who consume it simply consume it. Um, and they may say, oh, that was very nice. But it was more than very nice for him. And I, I think that's true of any artist and their art. How aptly and beautifully put. 
Ramesh, we've kept you very kindly. You've been a great trooper. You've been with us for an hour, despite the fact that you're probably still recovering very much from COVID. I cannot muster up enough words to thank you. And honestly, we are so grateful. Thank you so much, Ramesh. Um, if I might, with your permission, just show uh, a couple of slides that you sent us for um, about your stay at the Bengal Club. Um, and then we will carry on with um, the book club business, which is people responding to Reef. There is no compulsion. If you feel up to it, you can stay as long as you like. And may I ask Guru Dash, please, to show us those lovely slides? Well, um, thank you very much, Julie. I'm, I'm very happy to stay on and listen. And I'm very happy to take any more questions that uh, your fellow readers might have. Fabulous. That would be absolutely more than we had dreamt of. Thank you so much. Yes, Guru Dash, let's go through the slides very quickly. Yes, ma'am, in a moment. Thank you so much. So very quickly, uh, the audience, this is our, um, the body of work that Mr. Gunasekara has produced in uh, a few decades. And um, if you haven't read um, anything but the reef, which is on the table today, I would say start with Monkfish Moon and then certainly the prisoner of paradise. Uh, okay, Gunasek, um, Gurudash, please can we have the next slide? So here are the pictures. Ramesh, if you want to quickly comment on, especially the one in the middle, was that your room? Can't hear you. Ramesh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, sorry, I couldn't unmute because uh, you had to let me do it. But can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, I'll... Um... Sorry, that, uh, it's... Okay, uh, there's something up on my screen, but you can hear me, I think. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? We okay, can hear so, you. Okay, um... so... Just a couple, of, just a couple of pictures from where I was staying in the Bengal Club, uh, and yes, that was uh, that was uh, the veranda outside the room. Uh, this was a time when uh, I think the twentieth uh, anniversary of Reef uh, meant that Penguin India had done some new covers for Reef and for uh, a couple of other books, and they've just come through. Uh, so that's what you see on the table. And um, I wish I had a few more pictures of the room because that rather amazingly, I remember, I think it was on, yes, it was on that occasion. I was staying in a room, um, uh, I can't remember which particular room, but on one floor. And there had been some problem on that floor, as some of you may recognize occasionally at the club, you do have some small issues. Um, and when I went out for the day, uh, I went out in the morning and when I came back in the evening. Um, I went to my room and I couldn't get in. Ah. So I had to go and check what had happened. And they told me that, no, there was a problem with, I can't remember, the plumbing or something to do with the room. And so they'd moved me to another room. 
and that it was just on the next floor, uh, straight above the room I was staying in. So I got my key and I went, rather surprised that, you know, and disappointed having to, you know, readjust to my new room as it were. But I opened the door and it looked exactly the same. And not only had they so carefully done this, they had, not only was the room exactly the same, but everything I'd left in the earlier room, my bag half open, my clothes in two or three different places, um, all, of, all of it had been moved up as if by magic to exactly the same positions. So my shirt was in exactly the same position. My toothbrush was in exactly the same place but simply in a different room. And it was just amazing. That's the Bengal Club for you. And we look forward to welcoming you back and maybe trying some of our culinary delights from Bengal. Unfortunately, I had absolutely no idea. We had just come back from Canada for my mother. Wonderful to see you, um, Ramesh. Once again, big applause from all of us for the wonderful uh, conversation and we will treasure this for a very, very long time. Gurudash, thank you so much. We'll get on to our book discussion now. Thanks, Ramesh. Thanks again. Thank okay. You. Okay. So I'm the bad cop now. Three minutes, everyone, each of you, uh, without wasting any time, let's jump into it. And may I call Dr. Choitali? Moitro, Choitali, as usual, we'd love to hear your overview and whatever you have to say about Reef. Good evening, everyone. My regards to Mr. Ramesh Gunesekera. It's wonderful listening to you. Thanks, Julie, Dee, for everything. Now, regarding the book, I was so happy to see that whatever the writer was saying was fairly matching with what I felt as well. I think the individual's growth against the backdrop of a country which is trying to struggle for its nationhood in the Jelnerian sense is most probably the most important theme of the book. And it also tries to show how an individual can build oneself up even with a slight amount of ignorance basic simplicity if he is ready to let his false ego fall off. I thought that food is just a means to show how basic simplicity, verve, and a sense of awe can also help the process of growth to a full circle. Anything which is done with utmost care can lead to salvation. This I would like to couple up with what I've just now heard from the author, that identity will have nothing to do with reduction. That is absolutely evident in the book with Triton. Now, over this, there are many other layers which sort of enrich the identity of Triton, like for instance, the importance of praise, for instance, the power of the past, and also the irony of placing, naming, and coming to the fore of other characters. And finally, the central innocence of Triton creates a quote-unquote becoming factor. And this is presented to make it more problematized with the backdrop of political unrest, volatile times, uncertain lifestyle, meeting different characters and so on. And uh, finally, I would like to say that the conflict in the novel lies between the presentation, there is a dialectic which sort of involves the, again, the Schopenhauer sense of principle of individuation, which links the idea of individuation, not only with space and time, the reef actually presents space as well as time, I thought, but also with ra rationality, 
also with feeling for the other characters because in one way every character has a process of individuation so the novel is not only a good novel it's not enough enough to say that it's a novel which opens our eyes to how we should never ever think that we haven't done enough in life there are many black tunnels but salvation can be had and one more point while i was reading i also thought of a, a real life incident the life of saint francis of assisi i'm sure most of us know that he used to polish the candle stands in assisi and that created his moment of epiphany so it depends on how you do something very simple with a lot of your heart thank you as always on point choitali thank you so much <laughs> focused sharp and to the point and you brought up uh, invoke schopenhauer i think very appropriately for us and of course uh, saint francis thank you so much romesh maybe you have brought the nowesters to kolkata thank <laughs> you for the rains that you have uh, uh, sent our way <laughs> thank you okay uh, next up we've got anju munshi mrs anju munshi um psychologist let's have your views anju thank you julie first of all i think uh, uh gratitude to author to the author for having given us the true perspective about the book and i quite liked when he said that i am the author and you will find me in most of the pages of the book which is very true and um, we enjoyed the narrative of the book because of its simplicity because of its uh, ability to make us salivate because for every dish that triton made in the kitchen and for whatever little procedures he went through it really had me salivate in fact the christmas party got me ready for my 22 christmas party i could hear the clinking of the silverware and the glasses and i actually felt i am sitting in bengal club and enjoying my turkey the imagery is powerful the narrative arrests you and you actually feel that you're living in that particular space i think reef is all about the philosophy of living and loving and food becomes a medium it's also a very strong and a very powerful relationship a very pure good relationship between mr salgado and triton triton not only excels in his housekeeping skills but the way he he debones the parrot fish and he carves the poultry it it really deserves an aplomb and a you know a good cheer for him i think his uh, bonding and his love for food goes beyond and it stretches to people and relationships also i love the purity of this little boy he is absolutely pure and affable i also felt that food has been used as the literary vehicle for making us travel through the 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 nooks and the corners of our lives when i read triton i his his character in the book i actually looked inside myself and i wanted to find out what kind of aspirations and desires do we have and to what extent can we go to achieve and then feel rewarded recognized and accomplished it was a kind of a uh an inner research you know a kind of a psychological um, exercise which i went through what is it that we can do for ourselves to reach that particular state of you know uh, acknowledgement and accomplishment which he receives from his father uh, from sorry from mrs from the master the story has a very rich texture like that of the yellow rice the book gives us a very smart take on relationships like the tartness of the lime juice and i also found an atmosphere of erotica run through triton's blends mixes and combo meals nilly's portrayal is that of a sensuous and a determined woman and a feminine charm makes triton aware of his raw desires and it helps him process his emotions and feelings for example 
when she goes for a manual sauna, quote, her face was wet and shiny and her face bright. She opened the blanket briefly, letting in the damp hot air and said, pour it in, unquote. Triton's gastronomical feasts and adventures with the most sensuous descriptions, I think is akin to the fine art of lovemaking, like the love cake with 10 eggs and the perfect turkey bake. It's an expression of a romantic fantasy an uplifting of your sexual fantasies. The intricate and detailed explanation of food, I think, has a purpose. It's a deliberate and a clever way to get into erotica. Quote, she squeezed the lime juice on the raw flesh. I wondered whether she had ever squeezed a whole lime drop by drop between her small breasts, unquote. Further, mango for the skin, a body tonic for the lips, a lubricant for them to live to the full, the life of man and woman. There are also some deeply philosophical questions that the author poses when Triton says, why did we come here like refugees? And the master replies, but are we not refugees from something? Whether we stay or return, we all need refuge from the world. Then when he asks again, why is it less frightening here? And the master says, for your imagination is not poisoned yet. Brilliant narrative, intelligent interplay of words and culinary philosophy and the philosophy, what food is and how it's related to our society and our lives. Thank you so much, Julie, for giving us a chance to read this fabulous book. And thank you to the author for being here with us and keeping us involved, you know, with the kind of work and his interpretations about the work. Thank you so much. Anju, uh, that blew us away. I think those of us who are interested in food ways uh, and your close textual reading, um, these are aspects which will stay with a lot of us for a long time. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Harish, are you there? Yes, I am. Good. So you've got three minutes. Please, could we stick with the time and go ahead? Thank right. you. Thank, thank you very you. much, Julie. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, Ramesh, thanks so much for all your for your for, for fielding so many questions. <laughs> so for me, uh, I first read uh, Reef in 1995. Uh, a year after it was published, uh, just before your visit to Singapore. And then we met and, you know, you, you talked about the book. And then I read the book last week. And uh, I read it uh, over two days. And I must say, I enjoyed it enormously. The entire thing, I mean, the, the, the themes, the, the characters, the, the writing part of it. And I enjoyed it just as much as I did uh, 26 years ago. And, and if you have a moment, you might just want to address a couple of things that I ask you. Um, the, the first is uh, the, about the, 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 I believe it's a book of, uh, it's a social history of Sri Lanka. And at the same time, an ecological history of Sri Lanka. And as a social history of Sri Lanka, it's a, it's a rare book because I haven't come across another quite like it. And uh, it's a social history of great importance because it touches class. The whole issue of class between the, the servant and the master. A master who could have become vicious and acted like a colonizer towards the poor servant boy, but doesn't. So here you have a very enlightened master and a pretty smart servant boy. And that relationship could have, in, in the hands of another novelist, uh, uh, could have gone the predict, the, could have taken the predictable path of a colonizer colonized, or of, a, of a boy, of a boy uh, ill-treated to the point of tears or being denied food, you know, as, as lots of homes do. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you if you would have gone that way, if you if you would have at some point made Salgado into a monster, 
Uh, and, and the second question is, uh, you know, the, the, the book, the recurring three theme I found was the encroaching ocean. And this keeps happening, that the sea is going to consume us all and that there's erosion on, on the coastline. There's massive erosion. And this was a, a good 10 years before uh, the, the tsunami hits us. So, so did you have a sort of premonition of, of things happening? Uh, did you have your ear firmly to the ground? You know, were you talking to scientists while writing Reef? It seems that you were. It seems that a lot of research went into it. And that Salgado was the creature of a great amount of on the ground work you yourself did. Uh, so you might want to answer some of these things. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harish, uh, for those very Harish penetrating. Yeah, Ramesh, would you like to uh, jump in here? Sure, if you'd if it like me to, yeah. Um, those are really interesting questions. And thank you also to the previous two contributions. Uh, as always, these things are quite eye-opening for the writer as well as for other readers. It's, it's useful to get those perspectives and um, uh, I, you know, I agree with a lot of it, uh, but to come to these two questions, I think they're, they're important, the uh, sociological aspect of it. Uh, I was thinking of that, uh, partly, I mean, I don't know, we probably had this discussion before in some senses, but <clears throat> when I started writing Reef, I wasn't planning on a, uh, on a, on a kind of study or even, even locating it so firmly in the uh, time and place it ended up in. But when I start, when I was writing my previous Monkfish Moon, it was very much with a sense that this is a world that has not been uh, recorded or described in a way that satisfied me previously. And with Reef, as I continued to write it, that became quite important as well. Mainly the, the social and class relationships of this sort of uh, post-colonial society in the late 60s, I felt had not really been described. And so that was quite important to me, um, that kind of house, those kinds of people, the kind of interactions, um, and possibly quite important at that time anyway, 19, late, mid to late 60s, the, the ethnic tensions were very, very different um, and class perhaps had a bigger role to play in things, uh, which is why I think, you know, readers from all communities of a certain age can recognize the, Sri the, the Ceylon aspects of, of that situation. Um, but the issue that I was quite interested in was the relationship of power between Salgado and Triton. And to me, it was really a kind of uh, exploration how that relationship changes. So that you have Ranjan Salgado, who is, if you like, a person brought up to face the modern world. He is sophisticated, he is urbane, he can, you know, he's in a sense well suited to the modern world. Whereas the boy has very little education um, and belongs in a sense to an older order. And you think, you know, even the idea of the servant at that, you know, is not really a late 20th century idea, or it seemed to me at that point. Um, but what happens in the book, of course, is that they exchange places, in effect. Because when they do come into a different world, where they are both 
challenged. It's Mr. Salgado who can't really handle it and has to return back home. Whereas Triton has the skills to deal with the unexpected and in a sense is able to make his life in a new country, in a new place, in a new situation. And that transfer, if you like, of the power relationship interests me. Um, and going back to some things other people have also said, you know, the idea of empathy is really important. The idea of understanding who people are and how big their roles are, and that no one is just simply what they seem. They're never simply a servant. They're never simply a restaurant manager. They're never simply a marine biologist. There's a whole world behind, behind them. And it's very interesting. I remember with Reef, uh, when I came to India with, to talk about the book, um, how uh, a conversation in Delhi, I remember, where uh, a couple of couple of ladies was sort of saying, well, you know, I find it just incredible that a servant boy could even, you know, act like this or think like this. And to me, that was the whole point of it. Yes, anyone can. Um, it's not the privilege of any one class. Then coming to the ecological part of it, um, I, I think at the time um, when I realized Sargad was needed an obsession and it was going to be uh, marine biology. Uh, I was aware that what we were doing on the coastline was not a good thing. And I wasn't alone. I mean, people were aware that somehow it was not a good thing to be destroying the coral reef. It was not a good thing to do fishing by dynamiting fish and therefore destroying coral structures. No one quite knew why it was such a bad thing, other than it was, it was destructive. Um, and I did do, a, for me, what now I regard as a lot of research, because I wanted to find out what people would have known in 1969 um, or 1970 about coral reefs and the interaction with us, as it were. And so I did read all the, as much as I could find about it. And there wasn't a lot, so it wasn't that difficult. Uh, and I noticed that there had been symposiums and conferences like the one Salgado, uh, that Triton thinks Salgado should go to, um, where they are beginning to recognize that there is a serious effect on coral reefs, uh, human intervention. Um, but not really why, why what, what that would mean other than, isn't it a shame? Um, but I did, in a sense, do the research. I did actually write to one or two institutions to try and find out and never really got a response. Um, but um, I, you know, I don't, you know, I can't say that I thought some the terrible things that happened subsequently would happen. But it struck me that, that our relationship with nature was a, was a delicate and important one, which we were um, destroying. Um, and that I think came out of my own childhood where again, as I said before, I was very lucky and uh, I did spend a lot of time with older people who were interested in the natural world, were amateur uh, botanists or people who had a relationship with the natural world, uh, which I took to heart, I think. Um, and that comes out in, in, in later books as well. What a fascinating and enriching conversation this is uh, turning out to be. Um, all because the author is here, really. Choitali and Anju and Harish, thank you for the questions. And Ramesh, thank you for the pithy answers. Just wonderful. Um, Anusuya, Anusuya Pa, would love to hear your views. Um, 
Hi everyone. Good evening. And yes, uh, thanks uh, to be included in this discussion, and uh, very privileged to be listening to Ramesh uh, and uh, all the background that he did uh, to present uh, such a wonderful book. Uh, it's been such a an easy read, and uh, the storytelling has been uh, so smooth. And uh, like uh, Choitali had mentioned that uh, the purity in Triton is what really touches you because uh, the relationship grew and blossomed also because of Salvador's, uh, you know, although seemingly taciturn, he was generous in his tutelage. He was generous in providing for uh, the growth of this boy with all leaving those books around and uh, you know, generously making this boy aware of the science behind things. And we see an expression of his learning through the way he uh, employs all of that in the work of the kitchen. It sounds mundane, but, you know, the use of the coconut uh, fiber with lemon juice to remove the oil stains. I mean, and him uh, rationalizing the science within his head while he's doing all of that. Uh, it was, uh, um, it's, it's nice that, uh, you know, a child's view and the way a child is looking at the wondrous learning uh, that came out so beautifully in the book. So again, uh, we are seeing the child mind's observation and how the flashback to his life is from the adult mind and uh, how the two perspectives are being narrated by the, by, by the uh, writer. So, um, I, I mostly enjoyed, like Julie mentioned, the culinary details. Okay, so like he, it's, it's very tantalizing the way there are these little half recipes that are put in the book and uh, you're left guessing where it goes next. And then that going next is not really defined. So it leaves it to you to figure it out in your kitchen on what could possibly happen. And that's much of the... Um, the flavor that was in Triton's life. He was given uh, free reign in the kitchen. He was allowed to explore that creativity. And like uh, the author mentions, that's artist, that's artistry. And he had that, uh, he developed an art form. And uh, the, the story leads you to feel that, yes, he became an accomplished chef and he had a successful restaurant. And yeah, I think Ramesh is saying something here. Yes. Ramesh put his hand up, so I was thinking perhaps yes. he had something to say. Yes. R R Ramesh, please go ahead. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. okay. No, I didn't have anything. Sorry, that was just... Okay. No worries. So, uh, yeah, what I um, liked also in the book was, uh, you know, uh, I just narrate a bit of it. All over the globe, revolutions adapted, uh, dominions tottered, and the guerrilla war came of age. The world's first woman prime minister, Mrs. Bandara Naike, lost a spectacular premiership on our small island, and I learned the art of good housekeeping. So, you know, the whole world was uh, going through so many maelstroms, and this boy was focused on learning what he set out to learn. And uh, I think that that is the root of the success. And yes, we talked about the boy's purity, we need to also see the teacher was also pure. Like uh, Harish mentioned, there was no exploitation of the boy. He had a childhood which was robbed from him in the sense that he had to work because Salvador, uh, Salvador in the beginning says you should actually be in school. So he recognizes the need for an 11-year-old to be in school. But again, the learning that this boy could have in his home was obviously going to be richer. Like he had said, all I have to do is watch you, sir. Watch what you do. That way I can really learn. So I watched him. I watched him unendingly all the time and learned to become what I am. I'm, uh, I'm an imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And I think that is the, the need within this boy. He idolized Salvador. And all he could think of, breathe of, was to become eventually like him. And he was dedicated in his learning and that's that came out very nicely 
and of course you know all these little half recipes that come about the love cakes and you know the um, th those are very very interesting and i enjoyed reading them and of course his final uh, coup de gras with his uh, big uh, uh, roasted turkey and all in all yes um, a very very nice um, study of the uh, child and uh, the relationship with a good teacher it could resonate in any society and uh, taken away from sri lanka it could be true for uh, any two such people anywhere in the world thank you anusuya brilliant thank you brilliant uh, very perceptive insights and i think you brought a original focus on triton's character which um, which is not surprising coming from you you know has who has lived um, in so many places and you know the dynamics uh, you were in south africa for many years right yes i was yeah. and yeah. Uh, we do have the same you know a master servant relationship yeah. even there yeah. yeah brilliant thank you so much moving on we have two more members then we throw it open to our um, regular uh, guests um dr paramita mukherjee malik who's um a, a scientist but uh i think she lends a different uh structure and different point of view so uh paramita if you're here would love to yes. hear your views yes yes thank you julidi um it was lovely to hear romesh romesh ji also like the author here and his perspective i just loved the way it's a very smooth and a very interesting nar narrative the journey has been lovely while reading this book and i just loved you know new thoughts about mundane things like like when triton says the basket of paper collector you know the knowledge that would be packed into that basket was humbling everything that happened the whole world for a whole month you know there lies that interesting thing just a mundane thing like when you are selling newspapers the old newspapers this aspect we have never thought about that you know so much knowledge is going away and again like choitali di says i am with her when she says that he was triton was totally focused on what he was doing and he was again the author has told us so he was an artist he was an artist in his own cooking cooking skills so he did his best he was passionate about cooking and he did his did his best another thing which i really liked is the good streak in the boy when he talks about joseph the the previous servant he says joseph was just born and meat there was no space inside for a conscience for morality for any inner life i just loved that word you know but this boy always had a conscience always had truth integrity and honesty within within him so it was a lovely read and i really loved it and of course like the reefs disappearing due to change in environment all these you know these things which which talk about ecology which talk about environment has been you know reinstated within us and you know it's like a reminder that we have to look after environment otherwise it will like harm us in return so it, it was a lovely read i just loved it thank you thanks paramita once again uh, you know this considering that it was written in 1994 uh, and that this was uh at a time when we hadn't all jumped on to the bandwagon of ecological issues and not every novelist was uh you know pushing that cart i think ramesh did this at a time when it was pretty much new stuff you know so good point there our last member for uh before we open it up is um urmi urmi sinha Uh, my old friend from Jadavpur University days. She was a chemical engineer specialist. Let's hear your views, Urmi. Hi, Julie. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes. 
Thank you, Mr. Unsikara, for joining us today and giving your views. It was very nice and enriching. After reading your book, I would just say that, you know, you have uh, uh, sort of captured some things about a child growing up in a very clear manner. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact that I felt that the, the, when the child is small, uh, the mud is soft. And it has created a lot of impression by his seeing uh, Mr. Salgador. And as one of our members have said, that he's also she been a very nice uh, uh, teacher. So he was a, like a role model to this boy. Though he was coming from basically his, uh, uh, he should have had an educated childhood, but he did not, he was not fortunate enough to get that. And he actually uh, sort of uh, like having brought in as an orphan child, you know, though he was supposed to get his education, which Mr. Salgador recognized, he actually could not get that education, but he did his best to do and bring an identity to himself and actually created a career for himself in that household. He even said, you know, would it be better to be in an institution or would it be better if he was, you know, sort of serving for his master here? So he had the vision and the view of actually what it could have got in him to be having a career with respect uh, vis-a-vis actually serving his master. Every time he worked, he worked so meticulously and uh, diligently for his master. He had actually no laurels to look for. He was not thinking of getting into an institution like today's boys and girls want to get where I, I will get into an Ivy League college, but actually he was doing it sincerely from the bottom of his heart. I feel a lot of similarity between you, uh, Sri Lanka and our country. I visited the country and uh, I feel there's a lot of, uh, you know, similarities which I notice with the children growing up and uh, with the ch uh, pictures that you have depicted in those times. Even the children, uh, even the disparity that is happening between the haves and the have-nots and the wide disparity of, uh, you know, I mean, why is it that I don't have and the other person does have, somebody is lead, leading a very um, regal life, whereas the other person actually does not have a job and there is a number of unemployment is increasing. And that actually really sort of bothered fathers and where the businessman was shot. So these are things which are actually problems which were there and is actually increasing the basic disparity between the haves and the have-nots, which you have depicted. I think that was uh, quite uh, revealing to me. And I think you have project projected the book uh, in a very nice pictorial manner. You can sort of see the scenes very clearly, well painted. I uh, do some art myself, and I think that your writing has brought the artistic picture and I can actually see uh, Sri Lanka, I have seen it in the later years, Sri Lanka, even in those times. Thank you so much, Mr. Gunsekla. Thank you, Ulmi. Thank you for that unique uh, and very innovative way of looking at the child mind. Hey, is uh, Vivek here? Vivek, you're, uh, you're in Manila. Are you here? Yeah, uh, Judy, I am. Hey, how come I didn't recognize? Because you're under Indrani, your daughter, is it? No. Oh well, yeah, I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a connection that allows me to be able to speak to you. Otherwise, it would be wonderful. Okay. okay, so you have the Manila connection with Romesh, and uh, go for it. I'm so happy you're here. Really, chap. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, and uh, what a pleasure to uh, listen to uh, Romesh speaking today. I did have the pleasure of uh, listening to a BBC interview with him. It took place about six, seven years ago. So it, he came across so naturally there and he's, uh, that's the man he is. So uh, what I loved about this book, the writing is lush and evocative and refers a delightfully beguiling tale sent in, uh, set in Sri Lanka, which explores that into end lives of Dr. Uh, Mr. Salgado and, uh, and Triton, who learns to polish silver till it shines like molten sun. Uh, the, I quote, the polish was almost nourishing to inhale a rich odor of fenugreek and red lentils. 
In this watery dream world, politics casts a long shadow in the background, running parallel to the dying neglected reef, an ecological disaster in the happening, unremarked by man and an impervious hungry sea. The novel had a climate consciousness that was ahead of its time, and, and I wonder what the audience made of it when it was published. Uh, you start reading between the lines and notice the parallels between the impact of political change and the reef's mindless destruction. Mr. Salgado says, characteristic things, the times that tussles everywhere for power. But at least it had not been completely deformed by the spite so prevalent in our surroundings. The whole of our world, the politics of envy is the master of all our industry. Triton, his young cook and disciple, recounts the story of his life as a child from a small village who makes a new life for himself and whose world revolves around Mr. Salgado, who in turn becomes Triton's reef, populated by his master's moods and needs, his relationships, and above all, the food to be prepared for him. Uh, Ramesh writes some of the most sensuous culinary prose, which has been recognized uh, by other speakers today, in the passage detailing the creation of the love cake with 10 eggs, creamed butter, honey, and fresh kaju nuts, is, in his own words, pure gastroporn. The pages of the story are interspersed with titillating image, images, with a bite of chilies, the rich complexities of a curry, the tartness of lime juice, and the subtle sweetness of coconut. And lots of basting and plenty of salt and butter worked wonders. The stuffing of raisins and liver, tofik's ganja, and our own jam naran mandarins was enough to moisten a dessert. It made me long for a taste of his Christmas turkey and the exotic steamed parrot fish. When Mr. Salgado falls in love with Miss Neely, Triton falls in love with her too, but only insofar as he is his master's heart. He cannot separate himself from his master to become jealous or to desire his own relationship with the lovely Miss Neely. And even when he sees her naked in the bathroom, he only wants their love to succeed and to that end woos both of them with ever more mouth-watering food. Maybe it's the salt air that conjures up the lad's erotic desires. My instinct was to press the ears back with my hands and keep the entrances to her soul open like the lips of a glazed pink conch. There is, in one of the best passages in the book, a razor-sharp description of a bustling fish market. Their eyes like buttons and their mouths wide open in oars of surprise at being lifted from the sea. And is where squeamish Miss Neely witnesses the bloody bludgeoning of a reef shark, a manta ray, and even an unfortunate dolphin in uncompromising images. The scene evoked my early morning forays to Big Bagan, where blood and trails and scales flew unchecked from the boaty held by a fishmonger. Triton also enjoys reading, but for him it is feeling someone inscribing the soft gray tissue of my brain, writing on water and rippling my mind. I would sink in, the skin of the book rubbing against the skin of my thumb and forefinger. And the author finally skillfully adapts his tone to the protagonist growing up from the age of 11. The scenes moving from abuse early in the book to love, joy, and devotion. There's no explanation for any of it except that the basic decency that is in the foundation of the relationship between the boy and the man for whom he works. We are left with the conclusion that one can enrich, enrich one's own and others' lives through caring for them, says Salgado. Are we not all refugees from something? Whether we stay or go or return, we all need refuge from the world beyond our fingertips. Thank you. How lovely, Vivek, how lovely. You bring the essence of that beacon of hope right in front of us. That was really good, thank you. Well, who, who do we have now? Let's have uh, Mr. Vinod Pillay and then Roma, Dr. Roma Bhattacharya, um, Shutapa Mukherjee if you're here, and then Ayushi Ray, my master student. Let's see what you have to say. Starting with Vinod. Mr. Thank you, Vinod. thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, Mr. Ramesh Gunasekara, for a very, very enjoyable you know, discussion. Uh, I don't know whether this was more enjoyable or the book, because I love the book. Uh, it is a very easy read, as many people have said. The prose is very lyrical, and the graphic descriptions make you believe that you know, you're actually in Sri Lanka, looking at everything through Triton's eyes. Uh, there's uh, what I loved about the book is the way you know Triton has been explored. I mean, you get to know Triton intimately. You feel as though you've you know known him. And I'll come to that a little later. First, I'll put forward the two questions that came to my mind. The first question is that as a reader, for me, 
uh, it's all a story of you know Triton because he's a central character. It's his point of view. It's his narration, and he's the person that I come to know best as a reader. Uh, the coral reefs, the political violence are all backdrops, and uh, my focus is there. And uh, the political violence and the coral reefs, they're connected. This is getting degraded. The violence is unfolding. Uh, but uh, our poor Triton has uh, not much to do with the coral reefs because he himself says that in his childhood, uh, science was a big black hole for him. Uh, for him, language was more important than the arts. So if that is the case, then why the title Reef? This is my first question that came to my mind. And this next point is, Triton's development as a competent houseboy is explained. I mean, his growth is phenomenal from a, a runaway to becoming a restaurateur in London. It's a remarkable story. And, uh, but now in this, uh, his, the two aspects, once he takes away, uh, once Joseph leaves and the house is left to him, he has to become a competent housewife for which Mr. Salgado tells him it's very easy. You just, you know, keep observing and then you can learn. Uh, but what fascinated me was his rapid development into a cook who masters the art and prepares almost anything which his master or his guest would want. It, in fact, took me back to, another, to a great movie that I loved, Babbitt's Feast, where Babbitt's, you know, comes up with a very bountiful feast. Uh, and uh, everybody uh, with the finest wines and the most exotic of food. And people just, you know, marvel as to how it's happening. But in the end of the, at the end of the movie and also in the book from which it is made, uh, it's revealed that she was working as a chef at Cafe Angle in Paris before she came here and that nobody knew about it. And so it gets explained that this is why she could do such a thing. In the case of Triton, I was left wondering how this is happening. Because in the book, Mr. Salgado tells him that you can watch Miss Lucy and she, you know you can learn from her. That's all he tells her. And uh, going by the novel, the way it moves, I think Lucy leave, leaves shortly thereafter. I don't think you see much time being spent, you know, by Triton with Lucy. And yet he turns out to be such a great cook. Now, one possibility is that he had it in him. You know, some of us do have it in us. It just comes naturally. Like, uh, for example, my understanding of people is something which came naturally. I didn't need to read psychology, but I, it just come, came when I was very young. Similarly, I can accept the fact that maybe his being a cook is something like that. So was it that, as a writer, I would like to know from you, what was it? Was it this, without any training or mentoring, he just flowers into this fantastic cook? Or was it, because the whole story is being narrated by him, so was it a little bit of you know exaggeration coming in because he's talking about himself? So that's the second question. And finally, I just want to you know, read a small bit, which, you know, uh, this is something that I loved about the book, the kind of insight that comes in uh, about uh, Triton. Uh, this is from page 49, and I'm quoting, I wanted to tell him exactly what I had seen and what had happened. This is after the, you know, after Joseph, you know, assaults him. Uh, I wanted to ex tell him exactly what I had seen and what had happened, but the words were impossible to get out. I did not want to be tarnished by telling, by putting into words what had gone on. It would have spoiled everything. We would have had Joseph between us for forever. It was not what I wanted. It was better, I thought, to leave it untold. That way, maybe the event would fade. It would disappear. Without words to sustain it, the past would die. But I was wrong. It does not go away. What has happened has happened. It hangs on the robes of the soul. Maybe putting it into words can trap it, separate it. Afterwards, maybe it can go in a box like a letter and be buried. Or maybe nothing can ever be buried. I felt tense thinking of what to say. There was no way I could tell him the truth, however much I wished. The kind of you know, thinking, I mean, the exploration of what is going on in his mind 
uh, it, it, it sort of, you know, helps you understand the person. And it's as though you're partly Triton when, you know, you're reading this. So there are many such passages in the book which make brings Triton to life. Thank you so much for a fantastic uh, novel, which I enjoyed uh, thoroughly. Ramesh, your call. Thank you, Vinod. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for those uh, very perceptive questions as well. Um, <clears throat> where shall I start? <laughs> Maybe I should follow Triton and say nothing. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> the first question, okay, why Reef? Um, that's a good question. I. Uh, it was uh, it was not going to be the title. Um, as many people have said, the reef uh, and its ecological concerns and so on are important, but they have grown in importance over time, I think, uh, and significance. Um, the working title for that book was actually His Master's Voice. Um, and the image I had for those of you who remember or who are old enough to remember, HMV used to be a very famous recording label, um, his master's voice. Uh, and I, in fact, had in my head uh, very clearly, even the cover for this book would be uh, a long playing album, as it were, with uh, a stars and saying HMV. Um, and the point of it being that eventually Triton takes over his master's voice. And that isn't, you know, and the extraordinariness of the fact that this is the book written, as it were, or told by Triton and not by Mr. Salgado, who would be the natural teller of such a tale. But um, I think. Uh, while I was writing it, I noticed that there was another book that came out that was published called His Master's Voice. So I scratched that title out and I was not sure what to, to call it until really very much at the last minute, I think. Um, uh, the other working title, which was Reef, because it was, I knew I had to do some research about it. And I really couldn't think of anything else. And I thought, oh, well, we'll call it Reef. Um, I also thought it would be an easy, simple title, um, given my name and the difficulties people have with my name. I thought, well, Reef is a simple word. People can go to the bookshop and ask for a book called Reef. What I didn't realize, of course, is that people still find it very difficult. And people wonder when I say Reef, when I'm saying grief. Uh, and so I have to spell it out quite often. But, uh, that was why, and it's interesting that actually in in um, several of the covers for this book, quite often it isn't a picture of the reef; it's a picture of the sea without the reef, as it were. Um, I don't know whether you can see that, um, because of course the reef is really a metaphor, and that comes into some things that you mentioned, and also the previous speakers, which is. You know, the metaphor, the reason why it's important and it became important in the writing is that really it's about, um, it just so happens that a coral reef uh, is probably not by accident, but it, it does tell a story about the way we live, the way human life, the way human life um, uh, exists or has evolved and the reefs of course are are the oldest living organisms on the planet they go back you know right to prehistory they're the oldest forms of life um and what's so interesting is as it says in the book i think i hope it does i can't remember now um you know the way the the reef works is that it is powerful it's strong because of its skeleton it's because of its yes. dead weight it's that's what causes creates the reef but it's kept alive by 
by the corals, which in fact are very vulnerable and weak. Uh, anything can damage, but if that vulnerable bit dies, then this superstructure, which is so strong like concrete, begins to crumble. And to me, that's a metaphor for not only ourselves, our brains, uh, because you know we are quite solid creatures, but we are only alive while the brain is alive. And the brain is an incredibly delicate bit of ourselves. It's the most delicate. Uh, so that's similar. And it seemed to me the relationships that are there, human relationships are very similar. The relationship between Salgado and Nili, the Salgado and Triton relationship, again, survives and carries on over time only as long as there's some magic going on that is alive between the two of them. And that is, again, very delicate and can easily die, which is why love affairs and marriages and um, families fall apart, all of that. So that it's the more sensitive and vulnerable bit that keeps the strongest bit alive. So that was, in a sense, what it is and applies to memory and imagination. Memory is wonderful, makes us who we are, but without imagination, it's, it's nothing. Um, which then coming back to how did Triton become such a good cook? The million dollar question. Um, well, I think it's possible. Um, I'm quite a good cook um, and I had no training. Um, it was just using my wits as it were when I had to. Um, my father became quite a good cook out of necessity. Uh, my mother was a wonderful cook, but again, out of necessity, only when she uh, came, you know, left Sri Lanka and lived abroad and had to cook for herself. She worked it out. Um, so I think those fed into it. And also, uh, we did have a, a cook who, like Triton, was a magician in the kitchen and had no training before. So it seemed to me it's possible. And um, I want to believe it's possible. And I want to believe that even Michelangelo, you know, was just a kid who barely drew anything until suddenly he was faced with the challenge of doing the Sistine Chapel and he just rose to it. And I do remember Babbitt's Feast, a great film. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, thank as you, I, Ramesh. As I said, this is turning out to be a gold mine. I mean, we are recording this and I oh, hope a I lot. Say, yes, one, yes, yes. One, one, one other thing, because we have talked about food, several of you have. Um, it just reminded me that uh, there was not so much a book club, but I know of a couple of people who told me how um, they decided to reread the book chapter by chapter uh, and talk about it over several meals. Each one uh, was, uh, <laughs> was uh, created out of the book, as it were, <laughs> using, using one of those half recipes and imagining the rest. Okay, guys, we have a new idea now. Once the pandemic thing is over, maybe we could meet and do this as potluck. Sounds wonderful. Another new idea. Thank you. Thank you for Ramesh for that. Um, Dr. Roma Bhattacharya, waiting to hear your views. Always, Thank you. Yeah, you always have a twist in the tale and a new uh, perspective, so go for it. Thank you so much, Julie and Bengal Club for having me. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, yeah. yes. It's, it's really an honor to be in the presence of Ramesh Kunisekra and welcome to you. I just wanted to say I could spend the rest of the evening talking about the souffles in the Bengal Club and Triton's cooking. But I, I, you know, I will instead focus on the epigraph of the novel, which is of his bones are coral made. And I think that epigraph kind of directs me in a new path. I just want to say before starting, this is personally to you, Ramesh, 
that I come from three or four journeys when I was reading your wonderful novel. One journey is a decade after you wrote it, the journey from the south of Sri Lanka right up to the north and back. And I've done that several times. So there's a huge journey there. And the journey from India, Calcutta to England and back. And the third one is the journey of becoming, which Triton is all about. And the fourth one is, of course, the journey that took me across four continents and a sense of, shall we say, uh, a sense of feeling that roots can be mobile. And sometimes I'm not sure if roots are really mobile. But just quickly to say Triton was absolutely real to me. As many have said, he came out of the page as a real person. But more importantly, my own parents who led rather post-colonial lives had two Tritons in their household and they went on to great things. So I, I, I you know, it was very personal to me, this novel. But going back quickly, because of shortage of time to the epigraph, uh, as a Shakespearean scholar, I come in with this notion of of his bones are corals made. I come this evening from the perspective of forced displacement. How in this novel, the silent anguish of the forced uprooting of human beings, their lives and their contexts is not so dissimilar from the erosion of the coral reef. The vicissitudes of change are subtly, if not poetically depicted here, from rural to urban. I mean, Triton's attempt to reconstruct his village tank in the urban garden fails. The city lacked such water, which we understand the reader as the city lacking regener in regenerative life. And then there is the slaughter and bloodshed in the fish market that almost foresees the bloodying of the ocean with mangled human corpses in the ensuing Sri Lankan violence. The complete human uprooting as Mr. Salgado and Triton have to leave their country and the underlying grief and anguish is portrayed through ventriloquism. The terrified Tamil refugee doubly displaced, first within his own country and then in a petrol pump in England, completely deracinated from his language and life context. And later when ventriloquism reaches a peak when the Irish cormorants shriek and grieve and Titan asks Miss Sal Salgado the most poignant question ever, whether the ocean on the cold Irish front is the same as they left behind in Sri Lanka. Water is a central metaphor, almost a character in the novel. The ocean divides, the ocean brings together. It becomes a symbol of human existence at once life-giving and an ocean of blood. To return to Shakespeare's of his bones are coral made, it continues with nothing of him that doth fade, but that suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Dear friends, in conclusion, it is only in the creative imagination such as Mr. Gunasekra's betrayed so marvelously that the silent destruction of the reef and of human lives suffer a sea change and are transmuted in literature into something rich and strange. It's not what you do every day, but the thoughts you live with that matter. Thank you so much. And Ramesh, if you have any comments on what I said, I would love to hear them. Thank you. We are slightly short on time. Uh, as I've been uh, reminded, okay. but you know, this is no, this is very special. Ramesh, please go ahead if you would like to make a comment on uh, Roma's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roma. And I think, uh, yeah, I think, you know, you, you, you are zeroing in on a lot of important issues. Um, the, uh, uh, Epigraph, I suppose, the Shakespeare line, uh, I do love. Um, it was um, it was given to me, as it were, almost at the last minute. I was desperately trying to think how I could find 
um, a literary line that would somehow hold the book uh, and launch it in some sense, I suppose. And um, it was, as I say, just given to me in the sense that I was um, I was traveling, at, I, think, I remember I was going on the uh, London Underground on the tube station. And at that time, it's still, I'm not sure that they still do it actually. They still do it, but not so much. Um, but there was a wonderful idea to have poems on the underground, uh, which meant that in the tube train on the carriage on, on the side, you would have uh, occasional poems uh, printed, um, contemporary and classical. And I was sitting and in front of me was, um, uh, well, were the lines um, uh, from Shakespeare and obvious corals, obvious bones of coral made. It was just there and I thought, that's it. Um, and it just told me exactly how, how, how to look at, look at the book. Um, and I like your idea of the journeys. Um, and yes, in fact, the, the, the person at the petrol station at the beginning of the book is hugely, hugely important. Um, and that's a bit of autobiography, actually. Uh, that was exactly, that's pretty much exactly what happened once. Um, and more or less when I had finished the book and I thought this is how it can open. So it was quite important. Uh, the petrol station is still there. It's not very far from where I'm sitting now. Uh, it's changed hands many times. Um, there was a time actually uh, in the late 80s and the 90s, around about when I was writing this book, when quite a lot of the petrol stations in London, certainly in my part of London, were staffed by Sri Lankans. Um, and some of them by Sri Lankan Tamils who had fled the country and some of them by Sri Lankan Sinhalese who had fled the country for other reasons. Um, so it was, it, was, it was part of the backdrop of it all. Um, at the time when I wrote, I hadn't actually been to the north of Sri Lanka, as you have, um, but I have subsequently, and in fact, you might be quite interested in the other book I have, I wrote before uh, the most recent one. It's called uh, Noontide Toll, mm -hmm. um, which has a character who I suppose shares some things with Triton. I mean, he's a grown-up man, uh, and he's a he's a van driver, a taxi driver, in effect, rather than a cook, um, but one who travels north and south after the end of the war, um, and we see the world through his eyes. Um, but I know we're short of time, so I'll, I'll stop there for the moment. But uh, you, I just thought you might find that given your work as well, quite interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fascinating, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you for bringing those points up, Roma. And uh, look what we got by way of uh, a bag of riches from Ramesh, personal anecdotes. Wow. Um, is Shutopa, Shutopa Mukherjee here from Rurkela? Okay, then our last speaker, uh, responder today is Ayushi, Ayushi Ray, who has stood in Calcutta University um, and is my past year's MA scholar, avid reader, very incisive. Ayushi, go for it to wind it up. Good evening, everyone. And I would like to say what a privilege it has been today to listen to you, Ms. Vanessa, to like I was just telling to you, ma'am, that like it's just a wonderful, amazing novel. And to listen to you right from the author itself, it has been a privilege, uh, truly. And uh, and like everybody else before me, I will also focus my topic on the food inventory and the food metaphors that have been in the novel. So, Delmer Davis in Food and the Literary Theme suggests the centrality of food to human experience and to personal cultural identity is mirrored in the food preoccupations of literature 
and reach by Ramesh Gunasekara is not just filled with rich and sensuous food images, but also forms an important character in the novel as well. Rave follows the story of Triton, who was brought by his uncle to Mr. Ranjan Sardito when he was just a boy. 11-year-old Triton knew that to survive in this world, he needed to roast a master. And how does he achieve that? By making and serving the morning tea for Mr. Sardito himself without any supervision. Finally, he outlasted both the other servant and the cook, making himself the all-in-all -all of Mr. Sardado's household. When Miss Nelly came to tea for the first time, he made everything from coconut cake, sandwiches, ham, including love cakes. By mixing more eggs than required, giving the honey a good time to soak it, and by using a whole different oil for the patty. And when Miss Nelly was told, Triton made it, he couldn't be more happier. In fact, it made him so much confident that when Mr. Salgado complimented his cake to be good, he knew in his heart that they were far better from good because he had made them special for the lady herself. Food was like a love language for Triton. It was his own way of saying, I love you. And it was his own way of expressing that how, how flattered he was by Miss Lady. When he was ordered to cook a turkey for Christmas, he charted out a meticulous plan on how to make it on the perfection of brown which is nothing less than the, all the researches that have been carried out by Mr. Salgado himself. He knew exactly how to curate the menu, cook it, and present it, as he believed that food was the ultimate producer and worked henceforth. He was willing to walk miles to get a brilliantly colored fish just to make this lady smile and would take offense when she said that he might not be able to cook the crab meat properly, which again is a rumored aphrodisiac. In fact, he immersed himself in the food making process so much that he remained ignorant of the political unrest happening in his homeland, reminding us of the butler in the remains of the day by Kazuo Ishiguro. Ultimately, it was food which provided Triton with source of income as he becomes a diasporic restaurant here, far away from his homeland. Your food images and description represent personal identities and emotions along with subtle sexual overtones. And the entire description of food preparation, serving, and consuming add more layers of seasoning to the novel. Thank you. So glad you brought in the performative aspects of making food and all those classes on the feminist writers and Judith Butler comes to the fore. Good for you, Ayushi. Um, end of the evening, but certainly not the end of us looking at the other works by Guna Sekara. Ramesh, what can I say? Huge debt of gratitude is owed to you by all of us. We'll be in touch soon. Get absolutely well and recovered. And many, many thanks again for doing this for us. You made a lot of people very happy. Thanks everyone. See you soon. Thank, Thank you. you so much for such a rich evening. 24th of May is our next um, book club discussion. Thank we'll you. Keep you informed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Goodbye. everyone. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you, Judith.